Welcome to Film Detour, a podcast where two longtime film buddies take you down and around the back alleys and side streets of cinema. With the occasional left-hand turn. I'm John Knapp. And I'm Bob Muller. So let's go. John, you ready? I'm ready. Let's hit it. Today we're talking about The Long Goodbye by Raymond Chandler. Uh, the 1973 version, directed by Robert Altman and starring uh, Elliot Gould and Sterling Hayden. And some interesting character actors, Henry Gibson. The old, the uh, old Laugh-In guy. Laugh-In, and uh, Jim Bouton, who is a ball player. Mark Rydell. Mark Rydell's amazing. Mark, Mark Rydell He's is, amazing. He steals the show, man. He's yeah. fantastic. Uh, yeah, Mark Rydell was a, 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 a well-known actor, but very much later, uh, he became a, a very big movie director. He directed The Cowboys. Uh, he directed Cinderella Liberty and On Golden Pond. Is that Mark Rydell? That's Mark Rydell. Holy Christ. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I recognize his name from those movies. I never I, put I, two I, and two no, together. No, I, I knew he was... I, I, I was actually thinking, Jesus, that's the same guy, but it is the same guy. Yeah. Is um, the 1973 version of The Long Goodbye, directed by Robert Altman, uh, and adapted from the novel by Lee Brackett. Lee Brackett, who wrote The Big Sleep, um, Interesting that, you know, Robert Altman would, would, would get her to write the novel, I mean, the screenplay, right. um, because it's, it's a very 70s movie, but he, there's so many elements to this movie that call out 40s, oh, like absolutely. detective, absolutely. And, he, and it's so intentional, yes. it's so funny, absolutely. so wonderfully yeah. done, and we can talk about that as we go through the movie. Well, it, op- it opens up, you can see this is where he's going right away. It opens up with the, with the 1940s Hooray for Hollywood song. Yeah. You Which is this... like contrasting old Hollywood with new. Right. I mean, it's visually, it's total 70s. They yes. have this kind of crazy apartment building with the elevator right. at the top. Right. The hippie girls next door doing the yoga. Naked, girls. naked <laughs> always naked. <laughs> doing um, yoga. Yoga. <laughs> and the only person smoking in the movie is Elliot Gould. Right. He mumbles to himself. Yes. It's this great contrast between 70s, beautiful L.A. and old Hollywood. Yes, absolute possibility. The other thing is uh, he, he's driving um, a 1948, I think. I think it's a uh, Lincoln. It's a Lincoln Continental, yes. I mean, it looks so out of place. But it's, <laughs> what's, what's great is he, he even has the, um, the white wall tires, the big yeah. white wall tires as yeah. well. So it's, it's all these different elements working into it. And that, so we open up and he's feeding his cat. I love all the cat stuff. The, the whole cat thing is very, very funny. He, he wakes up, and you see all these, they look like scratches on his, uh, uh, on, on the wall behind him, and he's using these old wooden matches, which is also a 1940s yeah. thing. You can strike on any surface. Right. He just strikes it behind his head and, and lights a cigarette up. He's still in bed, and the cat is meowing at him. And, you know, it's, it shows a, a tender side to Marlowe because it's 3 o'clock in the morning, yeah. and his cat is meowing, and he wants to eat. So he tries to make up some half-assed cottage make-believe cheese. cottage cheese and some salt and pepper. And, salt and pepper. What was for the a other? Cat? I feel was, bad for that cat's yeah. kidney. What the yeah. heck is going well, on the, there? Well, the, the, the thing is, the cat's not buying. He knocks the whole trailer face down. Oh, what's down. the name of the food the cat likes? Uh, uh, a curry. Curry. Curry brand. I've never heard of I've it. I've never Maybe heard of it. California. Did they make thing? it up? I don't know. It's a curry brand cat food. So he he goes to the supermarket at three o'clock in the morning. Of course, he goes out and what's out on the balcony? Those, well, the, the hippie chicks are doing meditation. Doing meditation. And they, they in the middle say, of the night having a party, they whatever say, they're doing. Mr. Marlowe, can you get us some, some brownie mix? Some brownie what mix. What kind of brownie mix do you want? I get the fudgy type and the other regular type. I mean, does it matter? Because you... <laughs> Uh, are they adding something to that brownie mix? I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, I think they're, it doesn't. I matter. think they're hash brownies. So, um, but the but uh, let's, one thing about the cat, though, I just have to say, he he has these beautiful women out there. He doesn't ever really make a pass never. at them. I mean, he's like a lonely guy. Yeah. He's like out of time in this yes. movie. He's and I think they do this intentionally. He yeah. mumbles to yeah. himself. Yeah. Uh, he's alone, and yeah. his only friend is his cat. Yeah. So it's interesting. Maybe maybe they thought, let's put this 40s detective right in the middle of the 70s. It's just like a funny little setup, I think. Right. Uh, I, I, I heard somewhere along the line uh, an interview with Robert Altman, and he was saying the way he was looking at it was um, a Rip Van Marlowe. Rip like, Van Marlowe, Like, like yeah. Marlowe had, had basically fallen asleep for 20 years since right. the last you know, Marlowe-type right. movie was made and just kind of woke up and here's the L.A. that he's... You know, yeah. involved in. Yeah. Vilma Zygmunt did the cinematography, and I always think of Vilma Zygmunt as as really like this really heavy duty colors and whatnot. And this is such a stark looking movie. It's so bright. It it it, yeah. it almost hurts your eyes. It's it's that yeah. that harsh 
sunlight that you get in L.A., and it, it reminds me of, of the books, the Chandler books, yeah. because you feel that hot L.A. oppressiveness. Well, the other movie that Out of the Past kind of has that feel. Yes. Instead of like a dark noir, right. there's like this very sun-drenched right. kind of feel to but it. But um, so, there's, there's, there's so many seedy things going on in that hot... Now, did Vilmo Sigmund go on to do McCabe and Miss Miller? Yes. So yeah. I wonder if... In that movie, they do a lot of flashing of the negative. Yes. I wonder, I mean, I think I read it for this movie. I'm not positive. Maybe they did some of that yes, for did. this As film to fact. kind of give it that look, that pastel look. Yeah, and, he, uh, he, they, they were talking about something along the lines of uh, they established in the sunlight. Yeah. They were going to flash it 50%. So to right. really make it really burst out, right. really wash out. Flashing the negative is where they literally took the negative in the lab and flashed light across it is that correct to give it kind of this milky tone to it like the blacks weren't crushed black they were kind of milkyish right and it would make it grainy too yeah as well um so he goes to the store and what's funny is like he walks in everybody knows him or the, the guy with the big 70s hair uh, <laughs> he's, uh he's looking, mr he's, marlowe he's looking for the he's, look, he's like, looking for he's the, looking for the curry cat food that's he's got curry brand cat food on on his brain three o'clock in the morning he's sleepy and he, and he goes and he tries to get it and, and, and he can't find the normal brand and he just takes whatever brand he can find. He sees the guy, the stock guy. And yeah, the stock guy says, ah, this stuff's all the same stuff. Don't, you know, it doesn't he make goes, any difference. Just goes, take this one. have a cat? And the guy's, the great line is, what do I need a cat for? I got, I got a, girl a girl. <laughs> Again, Mr. Marlowe alone with his cat, right. uh, wandering L.A. Just a little aside here. There's an interesting factor to the music. John Williams did the music. And the, and the song by the, the lyric is done by um, Johnny Mercer. Johnny Mercer, correct. So the theme song, "The Long Goodbye," is really the only music in the whole movie. Yeah, there are different versions of it. Yeah. in almost every different scene. Okay, so he goes to the supermarket. He can't find the food. He gets another brand of food and brings it home. He stuffs it into this curry cat. He can. makes the cat wait outside. He closes the door. <laughs> okay, this is this is kind of pet owner he is. You know, you know about pet owner. John. Oh yeah. So you know, he's kind of pet owner he is. He keeps the cat outside the kitchen, and he starts fumbling around in there. He takes the the brand X or another brand and stuffs it in one of the old cans of. Curry, curry brand cat food yeah. and he lets the cat back in he goes oh okay you're already going he spoons it out yeah. and the cat's just not buying it no <laughs> he's not going to eat won't it go for it no way forget it and Marlo's like well that's your problem basically yeah. he yeah. doesn't care and that's when is this is kind of when terry lennox comes into the picture terry lennox shows up it's about three o'clock so in the we morning. see him leaving the malibu colony he's get he's he drives to the malibu colony yes. so terry lennox jim bouton the actor is in this Kind of convertible. Yeah. Uh, he goes to Malibu. He looks like Colony. a swing and suave, you know, happening in LA. And, and those of you, most people know what this is. Malibu Colony is this exclusive beach colony north of LA. It's guarded. The houses are all along the beach. A lot of famous people live there. And I'm pretty sure the house they shoot in is is Robert Altman's house. Okay. Yeah. Terry Lennox goes to the colony. He gets to the door, and one of my favorite things in the whole movie is the guard doing Hollywood impressions. Yes. And he, throughout the whole movie, this, and again, this is another like Altman, like throwback to old Hollywood. Right. Throughout the whole film. Absolutely. And he, he, actually, does he, a, he actually does Barbara Stanwyck. Barbara Stanwyck. <laughs> the first impression in the movie. Yeah. Barbara of Stanwyck. Barbara Who Stanwyck. Thought? Yeah, right. And Terry Lennox uh, comes running back out and he's got, we don't see what happens when he goes there, right? Because he. He's got scratches on his face. Right. So we never see what happens. No, absolutely not. So he comes back out, he's got scratches and he ends up at Marlowe's. Right. And he asks Marlowe. Uh, and this is in the book. Uh, I want you to help take me down to Tijuana. For some reason, he's got to get out of town. Well, sure. Three o'clock in the morning, take me to Tijuana. <laughs> right. So the plot really thickens because... He gets contracted to find this famous writer. His name is Roger Wade. Who's kind of like a Hemingway kind of writer. Without question, yeah. he is a Hemingway character. I mean, Sterling Hating's a big guy. He's got the beard. He's got the beard. He's having trouble writing. He's got There's, there's a lot block, of Hemingway going on in here. causing all these personal problem. He a, has, he's a heavy drinker, etc. He's got guns. He, I mean, it's a great role. He's like so kind of tortured writer. Right. And so you see it because he's drinking. He's not getting along with his wife. You can just see he's just got all this turmoil going on in his head. But at this point, we don't even know who he is. Right. We, just, we just know that this woman's looking for this man or her husband. And, and 
She brings in Ellie Gould. Uh, and her name's Eileen Wade. Uh, beautiful, beautiful English actress. Yes. Nina Van Pallant. Yeah. I think that's how you say uh, she looks. Name. She looks like my first love in seventh grade. Yeah. Perfect 70s blonde. And when I, when I looked up this movie, yeah, you know, I don't know how the movie did in the reviews and all that, but she got a lot of call out for her because I think she was just such just a terrific. knockout. She's yeah. so natural. Yeah. And, and she she's... feels California. She's got Absolutely. That blonde hair, the yeah. dark tan. Yeah. She calls Marla because her husband. Uh, Roger Wade. Roger Wade is, uh, has gone missing. And she's already checked some of the places he would normally be to go and quote-unquote dry out. Right. So Marla does some sniffing around, and he finds him at a doctor's uh, hospital called, uh, his doctor's name is Dr. Verringer. H- Henry Gibson plays Dr. Verringer, and he's very, very funny. He's, he's really this little tiny guy, and he, he's, he's running around trying to stop Marlowe. In this really goofy kind of... Inspected. So first Marlowe shows up at the desk. Yeah. And he asks, the, the, there's a couple of women at the desk, and you can see Henry Gibson from laughing in the background, right. and Marlowe's Milling asking about. for, uh, or Mr. Dr. Wade, and Dr. he doesn't say anything. He just stands there, like right. not like he's hiding. And he's asking for Dr. Verringer, who he happens to be. And exactly. He doesn't say, and then Marlowe walks out, and you think he's leaving, yeah. but he goes around the corner... It's hilarious. So, so, and he starts walking into the property. So so he, little Henry Gibson, Dr. V or Dr. Verringer, uh, <laughs> starts, you know, running around in this, this little weird, goofy Inspector Clouseau manner. But isn't that such an Altman shot? Like he kind of zooms and you see this yeah. kind of goofy, this guy, goofy running guy running, running through around. the grounds. Like he's never run two feet in his no, life. And he's trying it. to chase Marlowe across the grass. And he does, doesn't run very well, too. It's hilarious. So Elliot Gould um, goes away and then comes back. And he finds Wade in one of these rooms. And it's a great introduction to this character, Roger Wade, uh, played by, brilliantly played by Sterling Hayden, yeah. um, who is in this room. And you have the little Henry Gibson playing Dr. Verringer, who has tremendous control over this towering figure. Yeah. You have this towering figure, this huge guy of... Of, of Sterling Hayden and, like and Henry Gibson is, is almost like at his kneecaps, yeah. but he has so much power over him. While they're talking and, 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 and Dr. Verringer is trying to get the money out of him, we see Ellie Gould at the window and Ellie Gould starts talking and he, and he w- walks up to the screen and he has his nose pressed <laughs> on it. He, he, looks at, he looks like the kids <laughs> in Christmas Story with their noses yeah. pressed up on the um, like on, I, on the on the window, but he does it the whole scene, John. It's, it's so absurd. It's such a scene. Like it's he talks so through the window with his nose <laughs> stuck the entire time on the screen. So he was able to extricate Roger Wade out of the situation and then takes him home, much to uh, Doctor Verringer's uh, right. dismay. And and I love I love what uh, Roger Wade uh, calls him. He calls him. Uh, Marlboro, the Duke of Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you got to say that. You, you almost had it. Do it again. He calls him Marlboro, the Duke of Bullshit. Good one. Uh, and here's, I just have to say this. This has been a personal pet peeve of mine throughout the years. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Mr. Vilmos here. Uh, the night scenes in this movie are night scenes. Yeah. They're not blue light. Right. Like, I cannot stand it when I see movies and they have blue light for night scenes. Right. You have never see blue light. Right. This is just like white light. Right. You know, it just looks like night. Yeah. And it's interesting. He, he, you see Sterling Hayden acting in a way that I've never seen him before. I mean, he's, he's a terrific actor. He really tapped in, I don't know, to the method or something because yeah. he does these off-the-wall things. He walks up to the window while the dog's barking and he just puts himself down in a, in a position almost on his hands and knees and just starts barking like a madman at the dog because he's aggravated hearing the dog bark <laughs> on the other side of the glass. So all these really wonderful little things that he does, just it, there, there's no way that could be in the script. You read about these things and I, I, I kind of read that uh, Sterling Hayden was kind of drunk every day or just kind of being who he is. I mean, yeah. he was kind of like that character yeah. in a way. And there's something about Altman to kind of pull these great performances out of actors, you right. know? And you're right. I mean, it's such a naturalistic performance. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, he, he is the character. 
no ifs ands or buts. He is the character. You believe that the, he is this guy. Yeah, it's yeah incredible. he's not running around with these like cli- writer cliches or anything like that. He's just like a. It seems like he's John. It seems like he's pulling the dialogue out of his mouth. It's just, yeah. just it's just all there. And that's kind of the way Altman does it, right? I mean, a lot of his. It's, who knows how many times they shot the scene and half of it's improvised. I don't know. It but all it, feels it always, right. It feels it so all natural. Feels right. Yeah. Then, <laughs> then you you see the introduction of Marty Augustine, played by Mark Rydell. So they go upstairs in in uh, to Marlo's apartment, and Marty Augustine sees the hippie chicks doing their yoga thing, totally naked, swaying and meditating. And and, and, and these guys can't believe it. And and Marty Augustine, who you think would basically see everything, he goes, "Look at this! What is this?" And Marlo says, uh, "It's it's all the new rockets. They're uh, they're just training. They don't." Uh, Got no tap shoes yet. <laughs> and also, uh, he's got this beautiful girlfriend, and she turns the radio on, and what comes on the radio? You have the theme, theme <laughs> song to, uh, to The Long Goodbye once again. Again, throughout the whole movie, uh, this song just comes in and out. and it, it is the only music. What's perfect about it, again, is it... I don't know how it does it because it, it is a contemporary song, but it's got an old feel to it. it just well, it's Johnny does, Mercer. It does have this noirish feel to sure. it. And it just threads its way through the whole sure. movie. But I also it's think it's a tongue in cheek, at the very least, oh, tongue in cheek, yeah. by Robert that Ullman. Works. Because when you watch when you watch the old movies, they gotta work, They have to work the theme song in They always now. have some theme right? song, and it's like at the nightclub, yeah. it's at the this and that, yeah. but it works so beautiful. Yeah. And it, it does take you back from this 70s kind of contemporary movie. Right. To the only 40s. thirty years before the forties, right. exactly. So, um, so, so Marty Augustine uh, wants to know where the money is, and you know, Marlo's like, "What money? Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars that his friend Terry Terry Oldham absconded right? with." Yeah, he he, wo- he he went to Tijuana, right. and he believes that Marlo knows where the money is. Right. And during the course of this interrogation, Marty Augustine's girlfriend, who got spooked downstairs because she heard a noise, she she comes up. Very soft, gentle, beautiful girl, and she says, "You know, could could I, could I have a coke?" <laughs> so, so Marla says, "Yeah, there there are cokes in there." So she brings. Uh, so one of the, one of the henchmen goes out, gets a coke, brings it back, and you could see Marty Augustine getting more and more angry, it's empty more too. and more angry. So he's getting more and more pent up. You can see how more angry he's getting. So he takes the coke bottle and he smashes it. I mean, it's really shocking. It's totally he smashes shocking. it across this beautiful girl's face, breaking her nose. Who knows? Cheekbones, like socket, jaw. It, it almost looks like her eye. He takes her eye, but I don't think that's what happens. It's just, I mean, there's blood coming from everywhere. Yeah. So just savage. And she goes running out. The henchmen go running after her. And he looks at Marlowe and says, that's what I do to someone I really love. Yeah. And obviously, he does not love Marlowe <laughs> in the same fashion. So if he doesn't give up the money... Yeah. It, you can't imagine what this guy's going to do to Marlo. Yeah, yeah. So that's, and, it's a, a very, very shocking, very chilling, very upsetting yeah, scene it's to kinda, watch. And, I, and again, I read this. I think Altman uh, kind of felt he wanted a scene that reminds the audience that this is real crime and this right. is what happens in crime. Right. Things are violent. It's not like this romantic portrayal. You know what I mean? What's interesting, though, Mark Rydell is so good at this. He's so funny. He's so yeah. funny. But it, when it turns, it turns. Yeah, but and like it's all, terrifying. Right. All true, real criminals are psychopaths. Well, he he, he reminds me of uh, a combination of, 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 of like twitchy Phil Spector. Yeah. And, and, definitely and, Phil and, Spector. And yeah. Martin Scorsese in the cab in Taxi Driver. Yeah, yeah. That, that kind of crazy, kinetic, pent-up energy. As he's driving to... Um, the Wade's apartment again in his uh, Lincoln Continental. There, there's another 40s reference. Uh, there's, a, there's a dog blocking the road just before he gets to the Wade's house. And Marla calls out and says, get out of the way, Aster. Yeah. Well, Aster is the dog from The Thin Man. Asta is the name of the dog in The Thin Man. Thin Easy. Man series, William Powell and... Myrna Loy. Myrna Loy. Yeah, with great Asta, stuff. Asta the with Asta the dog. Yeah, so Who that's... was a big star in his own right. Absolutely. All right, so Marlowe comes back the next day to check on the Wades and see how yeah. Roger Wade is and what he's doing and whatnot. And um, there's a lot of tension between Wade uh, and, and Marlowe because Wade has the impression that Marlowe's got designs on his wife and maybe... The wife is up to something with him as well. He's very paranoid about this. So he says, look, uh, can you go take a walk down the beach? I'd really like to talk to my wife. So he starts to talk about how it feels to be a writer who can't write anymore. 
And he says, it's, it's like being impotent. Yeah. And she says back to him, I know that what that's like too, which is crushing. Yeah. Because you know what's going on here. You know, he's an older man. He's not as sexual as, as he was at one time. And it's almost like you can see their marriage breaking up. I mean, well, that's what that's, that's what happens in the scene. Yeah. This is this actually this reminds me of the scene in Citizen Kane yeah. where you see the marriage dissolve at the table. right at the table. table. You know, it starts right. out really nice. And as They're time chatting goes on, over breakfast, yeah, he, he makes her breakfast and he's very <laughs> suave and debonair. And as time goes on, they're just reading papers by the end of the, the, the at the end of the, the thing. It's a beautiful thing. Papers. But this is actually even more interesting because it's all done with, with body language yeah. and, and mood. And there's, and a, there's a nice shot in this sequence where <clears throat> Marlo's down at the beach and you actually see him in, in the, the glass. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's weird. A, it's a like counterpoint a because something. it's comedic. Yeah. Because you have Marlo down there just kind of walking on the beach lost and he's like jumping back from the waves. Yeah. At the same time you're hearing this heartbreaking story yeah. coming from Roger Wade to his wife. And, and what I felt was that, you know, she really doesn't hate him she really feels bad for him she yeah. she she still has feelings for him but she's kind of reached her end with him because of all the drinking and the destructiveness yeah. Here, here's where the whole Hemingway thing all really comes together there's an interesting ending to that or a point in that scene where he's like he threatens to tell he tells he tells he's going to tell Marlo about their lovemaking right well he says you know why don't you go ask uh, uh, your friend Marlboro man to, uh, to, to, to ask him when's the last time he made love in uh, on a beach in Tahiti, at Point Venus, in the in the lighthouse, and uh, when's the last time he uh, made love in a lagoon, uh, in the surf of the Great Barrier Reef, and in the blizzard with uh, in a double mummy bag? Yeah, see see what Marlo, your friend Mar Marlo man, has to say about that. And her reaction is, it's not his business. It's not his business. And which is very interesting to me because you know, again, Marlo is out on the beach. He doesn't hear any of this. He's he's this private eye. He kind of goes from people's lives to one life to the other. Right. He's never involved in right. real life in a sense. But, and I think that's what this scene says. It's like he he try he's trying to help them out of this problem. Right. But we're right now in the middle of their marriage, their personal life, and he's totally on the outside of right. it. He doesn't know anything going on right. here. It's a very interesting counterpoint when you it's see terrific. him out the window. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. So right after this is the first time Marlo goes to Mexico. There's a there's kind of a Mexican sounding version of the long goodbye when they he pulls up in the bus. Is they, it on the soundtrack? Yeah, and he, okay. and, and he has I the gotcha. dogs and he has the dogs follow him and whatnot. And, and there's and, all these and, wild there's all, all these stray dogs. dogs in the street. Yeah. Once again, there's some sort of dog theme. And and as Marlo walks past, the camera pans around to two dogs humping. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're, they're, they're playing there is a funeral that goes by. Yeah. And they're 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 doing the long goodbye with the funeral. And it takes you a moment to realize it. Because it's, it's like, you're, oh, this is like an old-fashioned Mexican funeral and the band's playing. The and, and you're like, wait a minute. That's the freaking <laughs> long goodbye. This song is everywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. When, when Marla comes back from Mexico, he goes into the Wades and yeah. they're having a party. And then Henry Gibson approaches. Dr. Verringer. Uh, Dr. Verringer. Uh, and he, he walks up to Wade and Wade starts abusing him. He calls him uh, Minnie Mouse and the albino turd. And he's feeling really full of himself. He's got plenty of drink in him and whatnot. So he's just goofing on this guy. And finally, Dr. Varen just says, Roger, you owe me money. I want to get paid. And he's not going to pay him. He says, to hell with you. I have no intention of paying him. And he hauls off. Little Henry Gibson, as yeah. Dr. Verringer, hauls off and smacks this hulking man in the face so hard. Yeah. And there's a shock on his face. Totally brings him down. Brings him down like, below Henry Gibson's off level. Off the pedestal. And yeah. he doesn't know what to make of it. So yeah. it's amazing how much power that this guy, Verringer, Verringer. has yeah. over him. Uh, it's kind of sad. You know, the way that he's like having a great time, uh, Roger Wade, big yeah. guy. And the shock of this slap just like totally collapses him. There's an interesting shot. They get up, they go stand over in the living room, and they're standing by the window. Yeah. And the camera starts to slowly zoom in, and it starts to move over. It's a little confusing. It starts to move over toward Mrs. Wade's face. And all you really see in the shot is Elliot Gould's cigarette, and then you start moving over closer and closer to Mrs. Wade's face. And I was thinking, geez, this is kind of an unusual composition. Where's this yeah. going? And then it moves away from 
her and just centers on the window. And once again, I'm thinking, gee, that's kind of strange. What is it? And then you see Sterling Hayden as Roger Wade walking down to the ocean across the beach. And you know what's going to happen. Yeah, he walks into the surf. And it's, again, it's almost a reverse... It's almost a reverse of that scene where where the, so the he, waves are talking inside and Elliot's court, outside. John. Yeah, because yeah, no. now he's the outsider. And, and it, like a lot of those, uh, Robert Altman kind of, he brought back the Zoom. In, like he made Zooming, which used to be a television thing. He was a TV director and he made it a real device in films. And that's kind of what it that shot is. It became a, a real weird. hallmark for yeah. filmmaking in the 70s. So you see Roger Wade walking into the surf while these guys With his are, cane. Yeah. And you know what he's going to do. He's certainly not going swimming. And yes. uh, they run out after him. They try to save him. They're floundering in the surf. You could see, and, and like, no stunts. No, no stunt doubles, I no. should say. They're in, They're in the there, water. And it's their nighttime. Ass off. Yeah, it's cold. nighttime, and that's a big surf. Yeah. And it's really sad. You see the Dobeman run yeah. up to the water. And he brings back the cane. That's a great shot. He finds he the just cane. Re- all he can retrieve is the cane, and we know what happened to Wade. Yeah. But I really like the lighting. You brought up the lighting before. I really like the lighting yeah. of this. It had a real natural feel that it would be of whatever the porch lights and floodlights right. on the beach right. would be, right. and the moon would be. It had that feeling like you were really on the beach, yeah. and that cold feeling. You could feel, honestly, could feel the cold surf feeling. So when you yeah. see... Uh, Elliot Gould later and, and, and Mrs. Wade later uh, had those blankets on. Yeah. Um, you could see why. It's got to be cold. Yeah, this like it's beautiful. It's ambient light from the houses. And normally, in a bad movie, you'd, you'd feel like there was a gigantic spotlight just outside a frame. Right. Like lighting. Every, where's this light coming from? But the, the light beach? source was probably just all the porch lights yeah. and whatnot, floodlights yeah. from, the, from the beach. So I, I really liked the lighting on that. And it made it feel cold in that respect. And, and another interesting thing, during the course of that scene, I thought Ellie Gould was terrific. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if he had a couple of drinks or whatever, but boy, oh boy, did he actually seem drunk, delivering his lines, et cetera. And I don't mean Foster Brooks drunk. I mean, you know, he actually seemed like he was drunk. So uh, I thought right. that was a pretty fantastic scene yeah. of just cursing out the cops and... Yeah, yeah. And it just, it seemed like he was pulling dialogue out of his head. And he said, I'm, I'm going to kick your ass. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get Ronald Reagan and yeah. he's going to kick your ass. The next thing we see is Marty Augustine is sitting up in his penthouse and he's clipping his nails with a scissor. Okay. And what song is he singing, John? The long goodbye. <laughs> exactly. So we're getting some more mileage out of that. And then the camera pans over and Marl is bringing brought in and there's a henchman Yes. Uh, and this henchman is, is somebody who became really well known later in life. And a governor. And a governor. Just like Mr. Reagan. That's right. This movie has a lot of connections. And I, you know what, don't even say his name yet. Uh-huh. I did not recognize him for the first couple of shots because he's got this mustache. Yes. And you kind of see him and then you don't. And you're like, wait a minute. It's is kind that of a, who I think that was? It's a cheesy was? light mustache. Dude. But of course, he's got the muscle shirt on. Right. And who is he? It's Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold, what? Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> the henchman? 1973. He was a famous bodybuilder by then. Right, of course. You know, he did... He Mr. Did, Universe. He, he did um, Stay Hungry, and he did... Um, Pumping Iron. Pumping Iron. He did Pumping Iron, which is about him, yeah. and, he, and he did Stay Hungry, which was his first, I guess, sort of dramatic role. So then, again, we return to Mexico. So we see Marla walking down the road, yeah. beautiful trees. He ends up at this house. Yeah. And he walks through, and, and sitting in the back there... Just is, lying in a hammock. Just lying in a hammock is Terry Lennox. Yeah. <laughs> Relaxed as could be. And very much alive. Yeah, and, he, and Maul is totally upset. Yeah. And, and Terry, his supposed friend, is kind of very uh, condescending to him. Marl says, you murdered your wife. He said, yeah. well, I, I didn't murder her. I killed her, but I didn't murder her. I mean, it, it, things got out of hand. She was screaming and yelling, and what was I going to do? And then he explains, I saw the autopsy pictures. Yeah. You bashed her skull in. Yeah. And Marlo, I mean, yeah, Marlo's a really sensitive guy. I mean, he's a real guy, I should say. He's a, a human being. He's a human being. He's very upset and by And this it. guy doesn't seem to be married too much. Look, this is, it got out of hand, and that's what it is. And, and there's know. a great revealing line from Terry. It says, nobody cares except you. You're a born loser. You're a born loser, Marlo. And, and, and that's, that's kind your, of That's the, your problem. You're a born loser. Exactly. And that's almost the feeling you get throughout the film, because Marlo's this guy that kind of He's like stumbling through everything, although he, we know he's a smart detective. And right after um, that, we have a shocking ending. And, and Maul is like, yeah, I even lost my cat, which to me probably is what drove him over the <laughs> edge for the next moment. And he pulls out his gun. Blows him away. Just shoots Terry. Terry falls over into the, the water. river and just 
floats away. And as Marla's walking away, who seems like he's got a little spring in his step, he feels yeah. like, you know, he did what he had to do. We see Driving Mrs. Mrs. Wade the same road, driving the same the road towards him. Yeah. He's walking away from now. She's, she's driving toward it is Mrs. Wade in her sports car going to join up with uh, Terry Lennox and, right. and have a grand old time, but she's not going to get the reception she expected. So that was, uh, that was the long goodbye. What you think, Excellent. John? I loved it. Yeah. Loved it. I mean, you know, I, 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 I've seen it a few times and, you know, watching it again recently just to, uh, to do this podcast. Um, boy, it, it holds up so well. It does, and right? it, and it And it's interesting because, you know, we always think in terms I of- I think you and I saw it way back in yeah. the 80s. A long time ago. In, the, in a retro house in yeah, New yeah. York. Yeah. Cinema Village, maybe. Yeah. And I wasn't sure at the time if I really liked Elliot Gould as the moral character. I, I had had in my head, you know, right. what you're supposed to be. But watching it now again, uh, he's dead on. He's he's a really perfect Marlowe. Right. And um, it's a it's a really great update, um, yet at the same time retro yeah. <laughs> version of, of the story because it has all that seediness of L.A. Yeah. in the bright sunshine, which is what Chandler had envisioned when he created the character of Marlowe. And it's somehow a classic Altman film. Because you do go expecting this, uh, when you first see it, you're expecting, oh, it's it's Raymond Chandler movie, it's going to be this great detective thing, but it's an Altman film in the 70s. Yeah, it, very it's much a so. really interesting contemporary uh, view on, on Marlowe. And it's, it's Altman, and he picked the right people for the right cast members, and he just he just let them go at it, and it's, it's obvious, it's beautiful. Yeah, But you, you do get a sense that he loves... Like all the old Hollywood films, because sure. there's so many of those elements we talked about in in this film. But right. I also think right. I also think there's that rebel in him, you know, uh, that a lot of the '70s directors had of you know, kind of looking looking at Hollywood like you know, uh, we'd like to thumb our nose at you. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where it's a love hate relationship. That's why he starts it off with that "Hooray for Hollywood" song, yeah, and, and ends then it. and ends <laughs> it with it because here's what's sandwiched yeah. in between. This is LA. Yeah. He's not just doing the standard detective movie he's it's his own take on it and it's so good beautiful yeah. stuff yeah all right well that's all the time we have for this week we'd like to thank our friend glenn ornowitz for his music and of course our listeners for tuning in so join us next week for another episode of film detour thanks for joining us for today's episode of film detour if you like our show please help us spread the word recommend us to your friends subscribe to us on itunes stitcher or google play and leave a review. Go to our website at filmdetour.libsyn.com to leave comments or email us with questions. That's filmdetour.libsyn.com. You can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.